my name is Tony Shannon, uh, and I'm representing the Ripple Foundation, which I lead, and I'm going to introduce Rob in a minute. Um, and I, I believe this is, is it Ostergotland? Am I not far off the region pronunciation with that? Ostergotland, yes. Okay, not bad. All right. Good. Okay, so I understand this is a presentation for you in your region, and um, we're very, very interested in what you're doing because you're beginning to take some leadership uh, in an area that we've been in for some time, but it's really nice to see the the uh, expression of interest you have um, in the kind of work we're doing around open platform in healthcare. Okay, so briefly, um, I'm going to just mention the Ripple Foundation. It's clinically led not-for-profit community interest company registered in, in England. Um, I'm in Dublin, in Ireland as it happens. Uh, Rob is, is in England, um, but I'll introduce the, the team members in a minute. Um, so that's that's what the Ripple Foundation is. So I'm the co-founder, uh, Tony Shannon, a medical doctor by background, Phil Barrett, who's also the co-founder, um, isn't here today, but he's uh, he also helped found it. And then we have basically uh, leads on various different technical elements as well as marketing lead and Rob Tweed is the Q lead and his technology which is central to our stack I think you'll find most interesting so he's here with me today and Rob um, are you happy to introduce yourself later or do you want to say anything about yourself just now? Um, Go ahead. I can, I can introduce myself now yeah so sure. Rob Tweed um, I've been in, involved in health IT for oh, since the since the 80s actually, um, started at the Royal Marsden Hospital. I, I pr primarily focus on um, tools development uh, in the in the kind of web space. Uh, so web web based tools um, and, and tooling and architecture for for web based health IT applications. Um, and Qed is the is the technology that I've been developing over the last ooh, six years or so, uh, which is the latest evolution of stuff I've been involved in for quite a few years. So that's that's probably it. Thanks, Rob. Yeah, sure. And you may come back to that when we get into more detail on your stuff. Okay. Um, so I, I thought it'd be useful for me to just spend a moment on my own background because I'm going to say some things today which you might find interesting. You might also find a little bit controversial or a little bit challenging. And I'm just going to wanted to explain my background so that I'm trying to give some defenses to why I'm saying what I'm saying. So, first of all, um, I'm a medical doctor by background, uh, I'm 20 years in emergency medicine, so my primary learning, if you like, in this field was at the busy clinical cold face, and that influences a lot of, of what I'm going to be talking about. And I think it's relevant because obviously this is a healthcare project um, we're talking about. I've done, I've done a lot of other stuff besides clinical work, so I've done a master's in IT management which allowed me then to take on a, a number of roles including in the large NHS national program for IT program which we won't go into but was a multi-billion pound failure um, and then also in uh, different roles in the biggest hospitals in Leeds in England as the CCIO there and the Leeds City which I'll be briefly mentioning where I was uh, involved in leading a team and then I've had various roles since then with my own little company Fractal as well as mostly now in non-profits for Aperta and Ripple. Um, and I know that your main interest, as we understand it, is, is in an open platform um, and uh, how do you might roll that out across the region and central to that platform is, is the appreciation of open air. And Eric, I know for a long time because I've been involved in open air for, for 10 or more years um, and over 10 years ago now I was chair of the open air clinical review board um, and involved indeed actually in one of the earliest open source implementations of open air with Sheriff Farah Khan and David Ingram in London called Operefa um, and I've been an advocate for open source for many years for just as long including an open source portal work that I began in Leeds and that's how the Ripple open source initiative began. So I've been involved if you like in promoting open air and open source for, for the last 10 years um, and that's why what you're asking to do is of real interest uh, to me and, and the team around us. Uh, so but if I speak about open air I speak about it with some history in the field. Okay, um, what I'll talk about 
although I'm really an advocate of open air for many years, is also the important things about uh, the broader context. So from the clinical front line, you may know that electronic health records have been waited on for a long time, but also uh, they have got, in many parts, a bad reputation if we're honest, um, and if you look at uh, the study on the right, which is a recent last year study from the US, which talks about electronic health records getting an F in terms of very poor usability, um, people do not like electronic health records in many parts of the world, and if you don't know this story on the left, which is the story of the emergency rooms there, um, this is where they have an industry of medical scribes, where they have to employ people to uh, uh, get the data in or get the data out of electronic health records. So uh, electronic health records have a lot of promise, but they have a lot of, of problems at the moment. Um, and this is my background, if you like, in seeing these problems many years ago and trying to do something about them. So uh, my work and our work together has really stemmed from that kind of clinical background. And I've had a deep interest um, in the change aspects of health IT, which are you'll know already about people and process improvement and technology. And that was involved from, you know, the NHS Connective Health Project to Leeds to the Ripple Foundation. We'll explain more about that. But we really are of a very clear view. Our main analysis is that the health IT market is, is dysfunctional. It's, it's a real problem at the moment uh, around the world. Um, and I, I've shown you that story from the ERs in the US, but these are other articles in the last year or two from the United States where they've put, put a lot of money into electronic health records and they have not been popular. So health, electronic health records have an awful lot of promise in healthcare, but we need to be very mindful of, of what the problems are. And they are largely about things like usability, and interoperability and scalability, and we'll talk about some of the solutions for that. But this is the important context for our work. So, um, I, again, I've been an advocate and colleagues around me have an advocate for an open platform for a long time. This is the most recent publication about this. You may already know about the Aperta Foundation um, and the work there to define what an open platform means. Um, and this is how we've defined it in terms of eight points around open standards, vendor neutral, common information models, open data, open APIs, federatable, and so on. Um, and I, I don't know, have you guys seen this paper? Question for you all, you know it? Uh, yes, I think I've seen it and skimmed through it, but okay. I don't think everyone has. Okay, but hopefully, I think it's a probably a pretty good fit with your own thinking in in the, in this in the regional space is that fair yes uh, and some of it uh, or, or we might have some other things also but uh, yeah if there's anything to object to sure indeed okay so our work really um in addition to that if you like policy and um, you know lobbying work if you like or education work has been to try to begin to build this open platform and we are very much i'm a very keen advocate as is rob in the role of open source in healthcare health it and so we have not been just talking about it we've been building this for the last number of years and we're going to show you how that's worked so just to go back in time before we get into the detail of our work i'm going to just go back to the history again um, I began when I left the big national program for IT doing an open source project in the hospitals of Leeds uh, with teams there that were also other clinical people involved. PPM Plus was the name of it. It became the Leeds Clinical, Leeds Hospitals Electronic Patient Record, um, which is now widely adopted. And this is a big thousand, 14,000 staff, you know, um, many, many six hospitals grouped there. That led on to the city of Leeds then beginning to take that open technology um, to build a, a, a Leeds Care Record, where we were basically, again, using open source technology to do an integrated record for the hospital and the primary care and mental health and community and, and social care. And this is all being well received. It was open source rather than open air, but it has a lot of in common ground with what, what we're trying to do, what, what you're trying to do. And just just to show that this is still widely used and highly regarded, this is Sec Secretary of State in the UK for Health, 
who was in Leeds recently and talking about the work we'd done there and showing that you know you can build very powerful technology that doesn't have to cost a lot of money and, and is working so so that was good to see that and that's that's a recent endorsement of our work okay I'm just going to go on now to talk about again uh, some of the areas that you're particularly interested in and what we're trying to do which is how do you reconcile or how do you build an open platform and there's a real implicit challenge in what you're trying to do where you have an interest in in open air at the back end and form generation at the front end um, and I think that's probably one of the areas that you're most interested in that that challenge of how do you do quick and easy uh, forms and the back end and that's that's certainly what we've poked up from your from your your uh, an early um, communication and I'm going to focus on that for a little bit is, is that fair comment is that a summary of what you're interested in yes yeah okay so my work and our work for the last number of years is how do you get that open platform built taking good good cognizance of what a good front end should be like as well as the back end and there these are balancing and a challenge if you like in the balancing of both of these and, and this has been a large part of our work for, for many years now okay so I'm going to talk about how important user experience is and the user interface is and obviously make clear that you know these are two separate disciplines um, a great user experience uh, obviously uh, should be then built with uh, be delivered with the right user interface um, but it doesn't necessarily follow that if you just build a good looking user interface that you're going to get a good user experience so you need to be careful about that and understand that a good UX is really really important and a good UI should go with that but really what we're trying to do here is stress the importance of, of user experience and user experience in the design um, and that's really key for trying to improve the uh, usability of electronic health records um, in the healthcare setting and here's an interesting thing that just came up over the weekend actually about the challenge of uh, how do you get better user interfaces and open air and and obviously the promise here is that you can do that because you can decouple the front end from the back end um, and, and that's something that fits very much with with our, our thinking and our approach so I think it's fair to summarize to say that what we have been doing for the last number of years is building the basis of open source components that make up an open platform that's open air based and um, by by tackling three key areas um, it goes without saying that we have uh, built uh, or supported, if you like, the building of an open source, open air implementation, Ethersys, uh, which is, if you like, the leading uh, open air implementation uh, that's been around now for some years um, and is underpinning our work. And then uh, at the front end, we've done a lot of work on the user interface and what a good user interface looks like um, and we have uh, done that because we think that that is also lacking in healthcare um, and in the middle we will talk later about how we have very seamlessly been able to pull those things together with Qt um, and how we use JSON to to come to to join these 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 things up but what we're doing is we're doing at least three things here we're building the basis of an open source clinical data repository we're building a highly usable customer in, user interface and we're building something in the middle that allows us to move to bring these things together as well as to join up everything else that you need to handle like other APIs fire and other things like authentication and so on and so forth so we'll come we'll, we'll look at this in more detail I'll, I'll quickly skip through the key components that we've built uh, just uh, again these slides will be available for you guys to look back at but PulseTile is a UX UI framework that's user centered in its design and uses patterns. It's modular, it's very JSON friendly. We have a React version, we have other versions as well. Um, but it's meant to be a patient centered UX um, framework that's capable of handling multiple patients and does uh, intel intelligence analytics work as well as handling lots of structure and unstructured data as well as being obviously mobile ready. Uh, Qt, which Rob will talk in more detail about later, is an enterprise-grade Node.js based framework uh, that's very solid, secure, scalable. We've used it um, in a, a variety of 
projects now and uh, it's held up very well for quick and easy things to start with as well as kind of quality enterprise grade uh, where necessary and we're using it for a lot of data integration and transformation uh, it's microservices enabled um, it's got a very fast cache handles message queuing authentication and so on and so forth again I'm not going to get into the detail on that but we'll come back to why that's been essential for us and then Ethers is which you may know about is the uh, open source uh, open error repository that we have uh, f f fostered and uh, supported led by Christian Chevalier and um, been forked uh, obviously already and it's uh, you know good uh, to see the uptake of that and what we have there is the basis of an enterprise grade uh, analytics engine uh, that can be used for storing data structured and unstructured to the open air standard um, but it obviously allows us to do stuff then thereafter with, uh, with the analysis of the data once we've got it in that form. Okay, so I think what we would explain our work has been building in the minimal viable open platform. So what we have is a, a stack of tools that I've mentioned that you can use for integrated care records, electronic health records, portals, personal health records. You can use it for population health. You can use it for feral applications if necessary. Um, we've done these three separate components so that you can reuse them multiple ways. So that's one of the key things to talk about, uh, you know, the, the generic reusability of, the, of, of data. Uh, sorry, of the components, I should say, for multiple uses. Okay. Um, I'm going to very just quickly skip that through this to say that what we have done as we build this is to build this with with various stages of, of a care record in mind. So from where you're not taking any data in from outside to where you're taking in data from an API to where you're storing data to then where you're modeling data to then where you're modeling data and reconciling data. Uh, if we have time, we'll go through that. But that's some of the many stages that we've thought about as we've been building this this tool. Okay, and then just to briefly talk about the update, the uptake. So we've had success uh, in Yorkshire and Humber, where our, our stuff has been used for a the Helm personal health record that's been built using this for the region of Yorkshire, um, and we can come and look at that later. But that's the basis of an integrated care record for patients. We've helped Scotland build the basis of their national digital platform with our tools um, for their purposes in Scotland. Um, and then we have had elsewhere interest in Ireland, where I'm based, also in Germany. The HiMed group are using Ethrises for their work. Um, and Finland, you have the company there using it for the Unicor at a, at a national level. And then there's a group here that have used it in India to build the basis of an electronic patient record there. So we have had good, good uptake and adoption, which we're, we're proud of. Um, our challenge, and we need to be honest about this, and you should be uh, aware of this uh, when you're interested in open source is that when you're when we've run a non-profit foundation using open source and open platform and we've been leading that and facilitating these things what we found is that most people have uh, while we've been making stuff most people have just been taking things so we have had a real issue in the last couple of months in the last six months where most of the big projects I've mentioned people have forked our stuff and they're just doing stuff now on their own without necessarily kind of wanting to collaborate internationally uh, which is an opportunity missed really and one of the reasons why we have a real a real challenge at the moment uh, we're not the only ones who are have a challenge in open source health IT but you, you need to know about that because it makes it, it is making it difficult for us Okay, um, yeah, I'm going to now jump into demo uh, mode, if that's okay, yeah. and begin to show you what we've built with that. Okay, let me just make sure that the demo is working here for a moment. Okay, right, I think we're, we should be good. Okay, so this is just the demonstration we've just, we've, this is our showcase stack, and w which has multiple la layers to it, and I'll try to explain as we go. Uh, here we have our analytics view, which shows patients by a certain view. Uh, this is by uh, the this, this, this geography or the age. And then I'm going to click and I want to see now what we call our multi-patient view. This is the second important tier in our stack, which allows us to group of patients. And this is a group 
sort of geography. And we can customize this, obviously, to kind of show different things. Um, and I'm going to now have a look at, at particular at this man's record. Uh, and I've got some IG controls. And we're now going to have a look in at this guy's record. So what's happening here is you're seeing our three three tools in action. We have Pulse Tile on top of Qt on top of Etheris, pulling data from multiple places, and now showing it. Um, and here we have what's a nice looking what we call our our summary role view, uh, which shows data that way. And we also have a simple um, tabular view here as well. And the principle of the UX is that it's meant to be very easy, very simple. It uses patterns that you'll see in many other applications, um, in, in good application design in the web environment, um, where basically what we have is a header at the top uh, for the patient, headings at the left, and then a common pattern all the time. And here you see data that's coming in from multiple sources. And here we've got data from Ethersys and another system. And what we're seeing here is a common pattern whereby we have the heading, the summary table, and the detail on the right. And the idea here is that you've got um, you're able to see quickly what's going on with this patient. And if you need to look at the detail, you can look at that detail. So the pattern here is the same in all of these. Uh, again, the idea here is you look to see what existing data is available before you add any new data. So we're trying to make sure people look at what's already there before they just add new data in. And then obviously, you can edit data if you need to. So the pattern is really the same throughout all of these for, for, for good, consistent UX pur purposes. But it also means we can take data in from other sources through Fire and other APIs into here and display them. So you can have data that's been persisted in open air, or data that's coming in over the, flight, over the air through fire, uh, through fire, and so on. OK, so what we've done is we've tried to tackle most of the kind of the key clinical concepts uh, that make up, you know, 80 percent of, of, of most people's needs. Uh, you have your problems, medications, allergies here. We hear multidisciplinary teams. Here we have a nice tool that allows us to have a look at the events in the patient. Um, and then you've got other things like notes or procedures. Again, these are all common components. So for each of these, you're seeing a widget at the front end. There's an API at the back end. And we have a template in, in the back end of Ethersys that it allows us to persist the da this data um, and the same principles th throughout these. Um, and here you see some nice looking widgets here for, for instance, uh, putting in vital signs um, and uh, adding adding scores. Uh, so yeah, you've got you've got quite a rich uh, piece of summary of uh, 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 sorry, rich tapestry of components here uh, that make up these these key pieces. Um, and so they all have the same principle of, uh, I suppose, again, at a patient level, you know, the idea here of the uh, banner and then at the headings on the left. And then we also have the summary table and the detail table here. OK, I'm just going to move out of that now for a moment. Um, OK, I'm just going to skip through those slides. To make sure that I've covered all those, I believe Tony, I have. Tony, one important thing there is that that was li a live system, right? That wasn't yeah. that wasn't just smoke and mirrors. That was that, that was uh, working live on a with, with all the components. All right, absolutely, Rob. Yep, indeed. And actually, well, let me let me do something more than that. Actually, let me show how. Not only okay. Oh yeah. So this is just some of the other components that we've built around. Um, Pax, image, PAX images and drawings and uh, WebRTC and so on. But let me give you an idea of the speed of this. Uh, and it's mobile ready out of the box. I mean, you won't be surprised to hear that. OK, let me give you an idea, a taste, though, of how performant this is doing something even more interesting, which is, uh, one second now, please. I'm going to just show you a demonstration from our Helm, our Helm demonstrator. And the reason why this is worth you seeing is because what's happening under the hood here is that what is going to happen is the patient is logging in uh, to their own environment. And in the, in, in the milliseconds that this is happening here, what is happening is that there's a call going out to a fire service, uh, which is hosted by an external par third party. And the data is coming back as fire. And in the Qt layer, it's been transformed to open air on the fly. 
and then being able to be persisted in open air and then presented back to the UI all in the space of time that you're seeing here. Um, so let me just let that play. So this is happening on a very fast. Okay, so in those in that in those seconds, what was happening was that the patient's record was going. We're going out, getting it from fire, bringing it back in, and then transforming it into the open air, persisting in open air, and then presenting it back again. Okay, and here you, there you can see you had two two open air servers in the back end. So yeah, I think that hopefully hopefully makes that point, Rob, about the uh, how fast this is um, for in in a live environment. Yep. Mm -hmm. Right, let me just move back here now. Okay, right, so I'm going to keep moving by talking about um, what I did with the limited time I had, uh, to be honest, with um, and doing this in my own time over the weekend to try to give you something to look at for the, your demo. Um, and this is mostly me on my own with a little bit of help from Rob, but um, what I was doing was taking your pre-procurement demo template and I was bringing that into our environment and showing how it could be used. Um, and so you, had, you gave me the template, you gave me the spreadsheet, and then I'll roughly show how we've managed that. Let me just, let me just jump over here for a moment uh, to do, 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 okay. Second up, Murphy's Law. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> As we said, it doesn't matter for the procurement itself. Yeah, yeah. yeah. This is just to give us good ideas of what to ask for in the real procurement. Sure. Okay. So let me just check. This is working. Yeah. Okay. So basically, this is a kind of a tool that we've got just to play with at the moment. This is not fancy looking, but it's it's raw, got some raw power under the hood. Um, I'm, I'm now going to have a look at the templates um, that we've got loaded up on our system, and you can see your pre-procurement demos there. What I'm able to do then, because we've loaded that up, is have a look at the schema uh, that was um, available for, um, yeah, for this one, and I'm able to, hold on one second. Uh, Oh yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so um, what we we're going to do is basically show how we are able to get the schema generated automatically, and we'll talk about that in more detail um, and as to how we did that. Um, but I'm going to just do that again from the output. Okay, so queued HIT is, is automating some of this for me. Okay, so I'm basically taking your template in and it's it's handling some of this. Okay, what I'm doing then is I'm taking your your template that's been loaded up, okay, and I'm manipulating, m mapping that to um, the form designer that you wanted to look at. Okay, so here we have a kind of a low code environment where we're using JSON to JSON transforms. And here they are, just JSON, but I can look at them in a tree or I can look at them in, a, in the text form. And let's imagine that I wanted to map um, something here um, and I wanted to map uh, uh, this value uh, in your template, which I've just added in actually, which is the uh, organizational path. And I want to then map this to a template that's going to create forms for me. So this is a form uh, template that I, I just made over the weekend. Um, OK, I'm going to add that path in there. Oh, no. I'll add it in there, actually. Okay, And then if I have a look down here, let me just check that. OK, so what, what it, we've done there is we basically got a quick mapping from the region field here that I wanted to map to that value and boom, I can now check that that template is working. Okay, so what I'm doing here is I'm taking, again, just to be emphasized, I'm taking the text demo, uh, sorry, the template that you gave me, loading it up into our system, looking at, at in a JSON format, deciding that I want to transform that to a form, and then I'm using the form uh, template 
to uh, an, as another former template, another JSON template, to actually transform that um, uh, with something that I can then use um, for the purposes of form generation. So if I look now, having done that manipulation, I'm going to look at your template, and uh, this is the data that I've, alre I've already loaded a little bit of data up. And here's the open air version of it, and you can see this is an example of the data with one of the patient's stories that you gave me. Um, and that's fine, it shows that we can get data in and out, but more importantly, it does two other things. I, I wanted to be able to have a very lightweight UI flavor that we would use for pulse tile, uh, which is none of the messes, messing the complications of open air, and it's just a key value pair. Um, because this is what we would use maybe to populate our UI framework, which is a key value pair approach, which I can co come back, go back to, but it's much simpler than open air, and I have done a little transform for that. But you wanted to know how you could automate your forms, so I did a template for that too. And here's, here's how that's working, and it's basically taking a form template, and it's basically, um, again, doing the, the automate, automatic generation of that. And then, if I wanted to then take that into a form generator, I, I could because there are tools out there that would allow us to do form generation automatically from that. Now, having said all that, um, what, so what we've shown there is we've taken your template, brought it into the environment, shown how you can manipulate an open air, show, you, show how you can do transforms with a very simple lightweight JSON JSON mapping tool, shown how you could build a form. Having said all that, this may be an ugly form, and I would say you have to be careful about just doing automated form generation from what you're doing, uh, with what you're doing, and, and be careful about what the UI looks like and the UX looks like. So what you could be thinking about doing, and the way we would be more likely to do it, would be something along these lines, and I'm just very briefly going to show you something else. One second. So we tend to, as a general rule, if we're doing development, we tend to suggest that there's prototypes and wireframes done ahead of time, and that you have some discussion with your users before you build any of this stuff, and this is what we did for Scotland as an example. And then when you've got your UX and UI agreed, what you're doing is you're building your UI components like we've talked about, and the UI person can build those components independently of the open air, and all they need to say to the uh, middleware is, this is the UI JSON that I want. Um, I don't want any fancy open air JSON, I want a simple JSON format. And so what we're doing here is we're suggesting that you can, if you really want to, uh, you know, build the very automated form generation that you were talking about. But equally, you can give your UI team power to build whatever good-looking UI UX you need, which we think is really important. And again, because of the JSON-to-JSON uh, JSON transformation syntax approach that we've got, you can you can uh, handle that uh, by just simple JSON-to-JSON JSON transforms. So what you end up with then is, uh, three key assets, your open air at the back end, your UI at the front end, and this J J JSON to JSON as is the only glue that you need, and you can use that for UI to J UI to open air, open air to, to uh, the UI, or open air to fire, fire to open air, fire to UI, fire to whatever else. So, so there's lots of possibilities by adding in this simple JSON to JSON transformation approach. And this is something we would commend you to be looking at. Okay, I think that's where I would then probably take a pause and go back to say that that's what I've done in your demo. It's not very much, but it was as much time as I could could afford to spend on it. Um, and I can talk to you, we can suggest you may be interested in having a look under the hood as to what's happening under the hood of the, the tech in Qt HIT next, unless for, for some reason you're not happy with the, with the little demonstration I gave, because I know it's not that, uh, that fancy, but it gives you a taste of, of how we would approach the challenge. I'll pause for a moment. Yeah, thank you very much. It works. 
Are you okay philosophically with the approach we're talking about or any fundamental things you want to uh, maybe contest or argue about at the moment before we maybe we, go into more detail? We don't want to rob you of time uh, during this first hour, so we'll go into details in the second in, in that case. Very good. Okay, right. So, Rob, I'm going to suggest I give you control then, if you're happy to do that. Rob. Let me just check that Rob is, is there. Rob, I've stopped presenting now. Hopefully you can hear me. Sorry, yes. Uh, yeah, I've... Uh, okay. I think I've taken, have I taken control of the screen? Can you see my screen? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah? Yep, good. Okay, and if I do this, it should see if the slideshow works. Is that showing everything up? Uh, yeah, I see it. Yep. Okay, so I wanted to give you a bit of an idea about the, um, what I call the queued health IT platform, which is an open source um, platform which I've created to provide a solution to joining up all the various components that make up a healthcare IT environment. Uh, so what, what I, I mean by that. So we're obviously focused here on open air, but open air in itself is only one small part of an overall environment that you're likely to be dealing with. Um, so, for example, you know, you're going to have things like a master patient index in there as, a, as a, another component that needs to be integrated. You're going to be wanting to do user authentication. Typically, OpenID Connect is, is going to be the mechanism for that. And you saw that briefly, actually, in the demonstration that uh, Tony provided where it, it redirected to, to an OIDC provider to allow the user to log in with a username and password. Sometimes as part of that user authentication, sometimes as a separate system, you'll want a role-based authentication system uh, as well to control the access that a user has to the uh, open air system and indeed other subsystems. Um, you may be having to integrate with uh, one or more primary care systems as well, uh, personal health records, other EHRs that, that may exist in the, in the environment. Um, and of course, uh, you're almost certain to have uh, one or more feral systems, probably more likely <laughs> one or more hundred feral systems hanging around that ideally need to be integrated uh, in as a, as a whole. And so when I was developing Qued, I wasn't simply focused on, well, how do we provide access and integration into open air systems? It was, how do we provide a generic um, integration uh, uh, platform that would allow all these kind of systems and pot potentially many others um, to be pulled together mm -hmm. as one. And of course, you know, you could say, well, we need to pull all these in, in so that open air can access them all. That, that, but that's not really the way it works. The, the world doesn't really center around open air. Open air is just one of these many systems. And I would describe it more like this, that you, you have this cloud of interconnections of all these various systems and, and the type of connection and the direction of the connection um, will vary from time to time, place to place, user to user. Uh, and FHIR, of course, is, is likely to be one way of, of providing integration of data flows but only one. It's not necessarily going to be the be all and end all single way contrary to what the fire guys would, would like us to believe. You know, open air itself has its templates and archetypes uh, which uh, describe in a very rich um, way the, the, the semantics of, of, of the data in a very different way to how fire sees it. So what I'm really getting at here is you, you need to be able to cope with, with, with any and all of, of, of these things. And so queued where it comes in is, is if you like to provide that cloud um, and, and then allow browsers at the front end, mobile interfaces, REST clients to then come through the queued um, uh, system to provide the coordinated access to all these systems. 
So briefly, what is queued? Well, it, 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 it's a kind of difficult thing to describe because there's, there's many parts to it. But uh, probably a, a reasonable summary is that it, it's a multi-mode platform, multi-mode in the sense that it can act as a REST API server. It can be, be a platform on which you build interactive applications. It can be an integration platform. And it can be all of those three at once. It's not an either or. It's all developed in Node.js, all written in JavaScript. So the idea being that you know, only need one language here for the front end, for the browser interfaces, and the, and the mobile interfaces, and the same language, JavaScript, at the back end. And everything is, is, is handled and focused around JSON, uh, even to the extent of the, the built-in persistence layer, uh, which is something I, I, I now call Qt JSDB, which in the context of the Qt HIT platform acts as an extremely high-performance cache. And you saw the, you've got hopefully an idea of the, the high performance in Tony's demos, which, which were, you know, they, they were real working demos against real <coughs> systems. Um, the whole thing is fully open source. Uh, it's very configurable. You can run it as, as uh, native components, but you can also break it down uh, into microservices, and each one of those microservices can be dockerized if you wish as well. So it's kind of you know, you can you can cut cut it in a, in in any way that you like, in a, the, the the appropriate way for your environment. So, if we look at a typical way in which um, it, it's built in terms of microservices, at the top you would have um, a, a an, an orchestrator. Uh, queued instance, and its job then is to coordinate the other microservices, each of which is another queued system. So, for example, that OpenID Connect in, uh, interface would be coordinated through a queued instance, which acts as a, an OIDC client, um, controlled from a configured JSON file containing the configuration for the OpenID Connect, and that would be used to then uh, uh, figure out uh, what the URL, the redirection URL is to be sent to the browser so that it makes the connection to the uh, OpenID Connect provider to do the login and also that is then brought into play to, um, to, to uh, as the endpoint for the uh, subsequent um, redirection back into the, the system once they've, they've logged in. Um, having done that, you would then make, probably make use of another queued microservice which uh, has provides the interface into the master patient index, another one for the interface into the open air system, and so on, uh, just, just kind of creating uh, as many of these microservices uh, with queued to interface each of the individual systems, and then the, the, the orchestrator providing the, the rules by which it knows how to, uh, you know, which ones to bring into play. Uh, at, at which point, and indeed, these microservices themselves can intercommunicate with them between themselves. They don't all have to go through the orchestrator. So again, very, very flexible, very powerful. And each one of the, 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 the systems that uh, has been built with this, Tony Short so showed you two, the Showcase and the, the, the Helm system, is using a different combination of, of, of these microservices. Um, one of the key things, though, about this platform is that it includes um, a, a, a mechanism, which again Tony has, has, has shown you in in, uh, in use, for transforming JSON. So what's all this about? So it turns out when you start developing applications in this way, uh, that you, you find that most of what you're doing is JSON transformation, transforming, transforming. Fire into open air, or vice versa, into UI formats. And if you've got feral systems, they might be, you know, have a, an API with their own JSON interface. And and it's all about JSON, turning one lot of JSON into another. So in order to make that quick and simple, and and remove the the, the program the requirement for programming for this, I created this thing called the Qt Transform JSON module which provides a declarative way of specifying a JSON transformation in a way that the transformation document itself is itself JSON. So it's a completely JSON um, uh, uh, technology. So we use this for um, creating reusable standard templates to turn an open air template in and out of fire. And 
reusability here is a key thing. It means that you can have peer, in the same way as you can have peer-reviewed open air archetypes, you can have peer-reviewed templates that say, you know, everyone agrees, yes, this is, this is the correct way to transform this open air template into this particular fire resource and vice versa. And then we can use uh, similar, uh, more simplified um, transforms to, to turn the open air templates into the, the, the more simple uh, UI formats that Tony uh, described earlier. The way this is done is using open air itself as what I call it the Rosetta Stone format. And, and it's all based around something that's built into open air, which is, is known as uh, flat JSON. Um, but in fact, for the purposes of this, we uh, queued unflattens that flat JSON. So it gives us the, the, the kind of full fat, full flavor uh, JSON again. And then we can use that um, uh, as, as the basis of, of everything else. The reason this, this, this becomes the Rosetta Stone is that each open air template creates its own flat JSON um, sometimes known as a web template. So it's, it's un, unique one-to-one -one mapping between the template ID and, and this format. And once we've got that format, we can then use that uh, as the basis of transformations to and from that. So, you know, we could take the uh, open air allergy template, uh, take its flat JSON, and, and we then create the, um, the, the Rosetta Stone uh, template document, which we can then use as the basis to transform in and out of uh, the fire allergy intolerance um, resource. And here's an example of a little bit of that. The, the, the example at the top is the fire uh, representation. The bit at the bottom below is the open air template. And you can see the, the causative agent code value and terminology. And in the fire bit above, you can see this curly brace format which is, is, is providing the, it is saying here's the path within the, the, the open air um, template um, for which you, you, you should map directly this fire code for the, for the substance coding, system code and display. And, and it really, it's, it's just doing lots of, of this stuff and then away it goes, it, 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 it uh, queued, will automatically build the, the, the interfaces from this. Now this solves um, a, a major issue that I believe that open air has, and everyone I talk to tends to nod their head about this. You know, with, with open air, typically you use this thing called AQL to get data out. You use some. There's a number of ways of getting data back in, but flat JSON is is one of them. Um, and the problem is that there's no obvious similarity to AQL. If you, if you, if you look at AQL, it doesn't give you much clues as to what the flat JSON needs to be and vice versa. And you tend to need an expert um, to, to, to sort this out. We used um, uh, Ian McNichol an awful lot, who I'm sure you, you also know yourselves uh, as that expert. Uh, but the problem is that this creates a major learning curve barrier for developers to start you know, becoming productive and, and using this stuff. So what I wanted to move to is, a, is, is move away from that so that all you needed to know was the template ID and then Qd would look after the rest and, you know, based on the the, um, uh, the open air template, the unflattened flattened J, flat JSON template that, that um, open air would provide you, provided the basis for everything else. And so as a result, you know, once we have that Rosetta Stone uh, transformation um, template, um, oh, so, sorry, Rosetta Stone format, the, the unflattened flat JSON, we can then apply these templates to generate fire, to generate the, uh, the, the um, UI format and, and vice versa. And it's proved exceptionally um, versatile and, and uh, you know, I don't think we found in any instance, even the template that you sent us, uh, <laughs> which, um, you know, doesn't seem to be able to cope with this model. And indeed, you can, you can apply this to any other proprietary system. So this, is, this provides a way in which you could then integrate um, uh, feral systems, provided you can get a, a, a JSON-based API in and out of those systems as well. So, so that's, that's it. Uh, Tony, I'll hand back to you at that point. Um, okay, thanks, yeah. Um, I just just you before you do, Rob, 
Yeah. yeah um, j j maybe best to update these uh, this team about uh, the conversation with Tom Beal around the you know w what we're doing. Obviously, we've been working with AQL for yep. many years, so we can work with AQL, of course. And I'll show you how where, what that looks like in a minute. But just that relay that conversation we've had with Tom about the latest on that standardisation effort. Yeah. So I've I've, I've you know, taken Tom through this in detail. He's had a, a look him, himself in detail at it, and he's he's agreed that yes, you know, one of the things that's needed is this what I call a symmetrical approach to, to getting data in and out of of, of open air systems, uh, and 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 kind of de-skilling the process by which the learning curve by which people can be developers can get productive on these systems. So he's he's um, actually looking at. Um, Standardizing and and um, uh, further streamlining some of the stuff that I've built this on top of. So taking the flat JSON approach and looking at ways in which that can be um, further standardized uh, within OpenAir itself. So so this approach, yeah, as as as, as um, Tony is saying, is very much uh, endorsed by, by by Tom Beal as well. So you know we're not doing stuff that's, that's that, that, Particularly way out here. It's, um, anything else that you need to say, though, Tony? Do you think? No, just to simply say that you know clearly this is at the kind of the leading edge of kind of integration with open air systems, and there's a right. lot of discussion about the open air JSON sp uh, spec, um, and you know the uh, spec that has been standardised at the moment. So we're obviously. Involved, well, we we're, we need to be involved, and and Tom suggests we're getting more involved in that yep. discussion uh, to make sure that there's a clear open source reference implementation of that standard. And I think uh, I'm, my my own view is that the work Rob's doing here is at the leading edge of that. Um, okay, let me just pick up on something here as to what that looks like, again for your purposes as to. Um, can you see this screen for a moment? Now we can, yes. Yeah. Okay, so in uh, in a recent, you know, the recent work we have been doing before the HIT version um, was along these lines. Um, for a heading, we had lots of headings. So for allergies, for instance, uh, yes, we could load, load the AQL in there, no problem. Um, and what you had here was uh, the, the two versions of the templates that you, your, I showed you a minute ago. This was a get template, um, and you can see it's a simple JSON to JSON transformation there. And this is a post template. Um, and so, you know, we've always had this slight asymmetry with kind of the gets and the posts being quite different in, in how they are, are appear. Um, and, you know, but it's not been a problem. We've managed to work with AQL and, and do that that way. What we're simply doing here is just kind of reducing some of that complexity by just automating for where there's templates where there's a kind of a clear uh, requirement. So here you have a similar um, set of uh, headings for, for allergies. We don't need any AQL in here. Um, but we're, we have a simple, again, JSON to JSON transformation here from the open air to the UI or from open air to fire. Um, and we're able to do that because the HIT is able to kind of process the template. And, and you're doing a kind of a select all from the AQL, I think. Uh, Rob, is that the way you're doing it? So that it it's just yes, that's, the need that's, for that. that. That's right. It, 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 behind the scenes, it does run an AQL, but it's it, the kind of the equivalent of the sec, select star from the template. So it's, it's getting all the fields and then it's filtering them and mapping them through the through this template. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So so this, so this is what the the complexity of the of the mapping um, be, be, is reduced to, is essentially a, a flavor of JSON as I've shown you earlier on. OK, um, right, let me just finish now uh, the first session by just um, going here for a moment, please. And yeah, so I think um, that's a session on, on the underpinnings of what's going on underneath. I'm just going to basically finish by saying, you know, I think what we would like to think of ourselves as, if you like, is leaders in this 
thought leaders and future builders is the way we put it in terms of you know integrating care towards a more patient-centered approach on an open platform um, and we're at the leading bleeding edge of that because we're doing that uh, to the latest standards and in an open source way from top to bottom and in doing so I guess we've got quite a lot of the key insights into the people and the process and the technological elements of the changes that are required um, we are obviously only offering three key components we know that there are many other components that are going to be required in the fullness of time in open health IT but if you look at what Pulse Tile is doing, what Qt and the HIT version is doing, what Ethersys is doing, you know, that is a fairly useful stack for, for any of the challenges that have been thrown at us. So I would say we've been able to handle a variety of complex and high profile projects uh, nationally and internationally that, uh, that show that this stack can work. Uh, I would say that we're aiming at a flexible but very secure and enterprise ready solution uh, in the sense that we're trying to make sure and indeed we're in London next month as to how you can showcase these tools on a hack day, in a hack day environment. We have a live in five uh, script that allows you to get live in our stack in five minutes and yet we know that this stuff scales at an enterprise level uh, regionally and nationally because that's what's happening at the moment with with some of the projects that have that we have helped kickstart we have deliberately uh, baked in a scalability and open air from the start so scalability and maintainability are in there from the start but equally we we would also emphasize our usability credentials and would suggest that you need to be careful uh, about just you know neglecting the ux and just assuming that a form auto forms generated approach is, is the solution certainly the rest of the hr industry suggests you know you you generate forms um, from the back end at your peril in my view you need to be much more careful about what a good ux looks like and we've done a lot of work on that and then obviously in the middle to tie all those things together you need a savvy a smart but simple enough middleware approach that gives you that interoperability between UI and backend and obviously other APIs like Fire and Qt in its JSON to JSON. Simple syntax is I think about as simple as we can resolve it to and we haven't seen anything else that does it any smarter than that. Uh, and I think that's where I was going to finish the first hour and just I'll leave obviously details of our website there and our Twitter handle there and finish I think the first session our session at this point if that's okay yes yeah, thank you very much is there do you want to say anything about uh, open HR and snowmed CT integration uh, and experiences from that before we stop the recording okay so um yeah so sorry open air obviously is, is structured information models and obviously we've done a lot of work on that um, terminology services and 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 classification ICD type of services are again another key component so we have done work on snowmid integration as another kind of API driven integration um, and we would definitely subscribe to the view that um, you need to balance uh, snowmid sorry information models and terminologies in your solution um, I I don't I didn't prepare a slide on as to what the terminology server that we had used in the past looks like but we've shown how you can integrate that into our environment as an API driven service again through Qt uh, we've also got a uh, little graph QL oriented triple store solution that could be used as the basis of a terminology server as well um, so just for the sake of simplicity we have not kind of we don't tend to roll out terminology services um, to for demos um, because most people haven't asked for that but yeah I mean it's it's a good question and it can easily enough be done as an integrated microservice I would suggest into the environment we've discussed um, and we could show you more on that but I haven't prepared any of that for today okay mm -hmm. thank you okay so let's